just okay let's get started so welcome back today we are going to cover the lecture material on virtualization that was left over from last time and then we'll talk about os virtualization okay so here is the picture you should keep in mind okay so this is uh, All right. Um, so this is the picture you want to keep in mind. This is uh, the definition of virtualization I mentioned last time. So essentially, it's a technique that allows you to extend or replace an existing interface. Uh, using the native interface, right, to mimic the behavior of another system. Okay, so we talked a little bit about uh, why you want to have virtualization, the history of virtualization, and so on. So we'll continue from that point on and talk about different types of virtualization today. Okay? So the first basic type of virtualization is called emulation. Okay? What emulation allows you to do is you can take a native machine okay, and then you can use the the hardware and the software on that machine to emulate a completely different architecture altogether okay so essentially you emulate or simulate complete hardware and because you are simulating a hardware of another machine you can essentially use it to simulate any machine or any architecture you want okay so that is what emulation means and okay, now once you have an emulated virtualization layer often called a virtual machine you can then run a different operating system inside it okay that operating system can run on the emulated hardware which could be a completely different type of processor it doesn't have to be the native processor okay so for example you can i will show you some examples today you can take an intel architecture and you can emulate an arm processor on it and then any operating system that was compiled for ARM will run on it. And vice versa, if you have an ARM machine, you can emulate an Intel processor or you can emulate any other kind of hardware processor. And an OS that was designed to run on that processor will run unmodified inside that virtual machine. Okay. So this is going to require that every machine instruction be translated to native machine instruction because the OS and the applications are going to uh, execute the instructions on the emulated hardware. Okay. Clearly those instructions are not going to run as is because the native processor is different. So it's going to require translation of all these native instructions to, uh, or rather all the ex uh, emulated instructions to native instructions. Okay. This is going to cause a significant slowdown because every assembly instruction or machine instruction has to be translated and executed. Okay? So emulation gives you a lot of flexibility. It allows you to emulate other kinds of hardware that you may not have on your machine, but it also comes with a big performance penalty because you are going to significantly slow down the execution of whatever it is that you're emulating. Okay? So essentially think of it as a software simulation of hardware. Okay? So that's going to be slow at some level. So this is why you're going to actually take a performance hit. Okay, there are several examples of emulation software that are out there. Okay, there are two that are open source and popular, one called Box, another called uh, Qmu. Okay, Qmu is quite popular now, so is Box to some degree, but a lot of Linux software actually uses Qmu for, uh, uh, for doing its emulation. Okay, and then there are other commercial ones there used to be one called virtual PC for the Mac. Uh, before Mac computers were Intel based, they used to be power PC based. Okay? So that software essentially emulated an x86 PC on a power PC machine and it allowed you to run Windows because Windows ran on only on x86 machine. Okay? So, the, so those are some examples and I'm going to show you one in just a little while. Okay? So that's full emulation. Okay, the next step is native virtualization. Okay, native virtualization, the emulated processor okay, is the same as the underlying processor. So you are emulating an x86 processor 
using x86 processor that's on the underlying hardware. Okay, so essentially, this is going to allow you to run your virtualized software at a much lower performance penalty. Okay, this is because the instructions are already x86 instructions if you're doing x86 on x86. So there is no translation involved. You can directly execute those instructions on the native hardware. Okay, so, so that's uh, an advantage of native virtualization is it's going to be much faster. The limitation is you can only run operating systems and applications that are designed for the same underlying hardware because you're essentially emulating the same CPU. It's like you are emulating an x86 processor using an x86 processor. Okay? And we looked at several examples of why you might need this. We said you might want to do developments on your desktop or you might have a server where you want to run multiple applications and sandboxes and so on. Okay, your question? Okay. So again, there are many examples of this. Some you may have encountered if you use something called VirtualBox, that is essentially an example of native virtualization. There are uh, lots of others that we'll talk about also. Okay. Uh, VMware workstations, parallel, the, the list goes on. We'll talk about several examples today. Okay. Even in native virtualization, it sh I should mention that once you have your virtual machine, you can run unmodified operating systems and unmodified applications. You do not have to change your application. You do not have to change your OS. They are going to run as if, as if they're running on real hardware. Okay, same is true of emulation. So in both of these two cases, you don't change the software at all. The software believes that it's actually running on some real hardware, even though it's running on an emulated virtual machine or is running on native virtualization okay, layer. Okay, so there are several other types of virtualization. Okay, we'll look at some of them, but I just want to mention all of them here. The next one is called para virtualization. Okay, in para virtualization, you essentially change the OS in order to support, better support virtualization. Okay, why you have to change the OS, we'll see in a few slides. Okay, in the previous two cases, you used unmodified OS. Okay, so you can essentially take your Windows DVD and stick it in and it will just run as is, no need to change anything. Okay? Or you can just download Linux and just install it and it will run. In para virtualization, that's not the case. You're assuming that your OS actually is modified to explicitly support virtualization. Okay? So you run a modified version of an OS and then you can do whatever you want on top of that. It just looks like modified OS believes it's running inside a virtual machine like in the previous two cases. The only thing is, that the OS is modified, but the applications are unmodified. You don't change the applications, okay? You do have to change the OS. And again, as I said, we'll talk about this in a little more detail and you'll understand why you have to change the OS at all, okay? Then the next layer up is OS level virtualization. So on the previous three cases, you are essentially emulating the hardware layer, okay? Remember I said, you can implement virtualization at different layers. So emulation, native virtualization and para virtualization are essentially emulating the hardware and the processor or virtualizing the hardware and the processor. Okay? In OS level virtualization, you have moved up one level up the software stack and now you're using the OS interface to virtualize resources. Okay? So in this case, you can run multiple virtual machines on top of an existing OS kernel okay? and then uh, you essentially can run applications. They see isolated instance of a virtual machine, okay? and uh, you basically get an illusion that you are uh, you run on a isolated machine. Okay? This is going to be much more lightweight than running an entire uh, OS on top of a virtual machine, because in this case you don't run another OS inside the virtual machine. It's the same underlying OS. You already have one OS. They're simply emulating its interface and isolating some processes. Okay. Example of this kind of virtualization are Linux containers, Docker, and things of that sort. Okay. Again, we'll look at that in more detail. Yes, you have a question. With your virtual application, you mentioned you use Contact OS, but is it like the Yes. Okay. That's a good question. The question is in para virtualization, I said you modify the OS, but is the processor being emulated the same as the native? So I should have mentioned that 
para virtualization is similar to native virtualization in that the, the virtualized processor hard and the hardware is same as the underlying one okay uh, except that you you run an unmodified in one case you run an unmodified os in para virtualization you run a modified os okay it's not like emulation in that regard okay so that's os level virtualization there are several examples i already mentioned linux container docker but there is in other operating systems are similar features in bsd there's something called a jail solaris you have something called zones and containers there are other types of linux contain uh, uh, virtual os virtualization like v servers and so on okay we'll look at docker and linux containers again in a bit more detail okay and at the highest level of the software stack you have application level virtualization here you use one application interface to emulate another one okay the most common example here is the java virtual machine okay which is written in c using c libraries and c interfaces it exports the java interface okay a java virtual machine interface in particular okay uh, so and then there are many others like wine which uses uh, the native interface to emulate windows 32 and win win 64 api so you can run windows uh, applications using wine on other operating system okay and then uh, there is this technology called rosetta which runs on mac and again i'll show you okay what it does is it allows you to run binaries compiled on one architecture on another okay so it's a application level binary translation technique that allows you to run unmodified applications on some other machine other type of hardware okay another example of application level virtualization okay? and some of this we'll look at in a little more detail today okay that's the list now let's go into some of them in detail we'll start with um, essentially native virtualization okay? and so uh, the way to understand this okay is the virtualization layer in this case is called a hypervisor also called a virtual machine monitor or a vmm okay vmm is a control software for vms which are virtual machines but we are going to use the term hypervisor they are somewhat used in an interchangeable fashion okay so there are two kinds of hypervisors that implement full or native virtualization okay they are called type 1 and type 2 they're just numbered okay that's the terminology used so we are going to go with the same terminology here is an example of type 1 hypervisor okay so what does this show us so type 1 hypervisor runs on what is called bare metal okay when you boot that machine you don't boot an os like vinac uh, like windows linux or mac you boot the hypervisor the hypervisor is the os okay so an hypervisor is a special type of an os kernel so it is this os can only do virtualization that's what it is designed for you can't run browsers and other things on it you can only run virtual machine so think of it as a type 1 hypervisor is a special operating system that is designed only to run virtual machines as application it's not a general purpose os like windows okay so it runs on bare metal so when you boot the machine your hypervisor is the thing that boots okay you don't boot linux or something else on it Okay. and once it boots up you can then run multiple virtual machines on top okay in this case you can see that there are two virtual machines that are running okay. in this example one vm is running windows and then windows apps run on that okay and another virtual machine is running linux and linux app run on it. and you can create as many virtual machines as you want so long as you have the resources to run all of them okay yes you have a question okay question is in this case each of these virtual machines and the operating systems running on it do they expect the same hardware the answer is yes what the hypervisor does is it gives a illusion to windows that it is running on x86 emulating an x86 and well, it's not in this case not real emulation but it's virtualizing and presenting a virtual x86 processor okay so windows just thinks it's running on its own machine even though it's actually running inside a virtual machine not a physical machine and so does linux it also sees the abstraction of a physical machine okay now the hypervisor can allocate resources to virtual machine just as an os allocates resources to processes the os decides how much memory to give to a process like a browser how much cpu to give to it and so on 
so so is the case here the hypervisor has to schedule virtual machine just as an os schedules processes and threads the hypervisor does that for virtual machine it can decide how much memory to give to windows it can decide how many cores to allocate to windows and so on okay these are virtual resources but they get mapped to physical resources is there a question okay please Okay. Okay. So question is: Is this type one native or para virtualization? So this can be either one. Okay. We will see that uh, in just a moment. Okay. But yeah. So that doesn't matter. You can you can have either one in this case. Okay. So this is called type one. Okay. This is an example. On the other figure is an example of what is a type two hypervisor. So what's the main difference? In a type two hypervisor, you first boot a normal OS. you are going to run whatever you run windows linux mac on your machine okay and hypervisor essentially is an application that runs on top of your os it just looks like a normal application just as your browsers and mail clients and all of those you have a virtualization application that basically runs a hypervisor okay this is called a type 2 hypervisor okay because in this case the hypervisor is not the real os there's a real os running underneath it the hypervisor is act effectively an application that runs on top of the os okay in type 1 hypervisor the hypervisor is actually the os that boots up on the machine that is not the case here okay but beyond that distinction there is no other difference even on this type 2 hypervisor you can create virtual machines inside those virtual machines you can boot an entire os okay? and then you can have multiple of them okay so here the so the the os that the machine boots on is called the host operating system that's the os that runs on the host okay always the os that runs inside the virtual machine is called a guest operating system okay so the os that runs here is called the guest that's the host in the type 1 hypervisor these are also guest operating systems okay yes question type 2 hypervisor is responsible for type 1 type 2 hypervisor having multiple guest hours or is it each customer having that Okay, so question is in type two hypervisor can the can you have multiple guest operating system, right? So the way you are going to make this work in in both cases is first to create a virtual machine. That's like you go out and bought a laptop, right? Instead of buying a real hardware, you make a emulated hardware. It's called a virtual machine. Okay, then you essentially that virtual machine looks exactly like a physical machine except that it's all simulated in software. so you load an os on it and then you run your applications on it and that is not going to be any different whether it's type 1 or type 2 okay so you'll create a blank machine and it'll have a blank virtual disk and then you'll install an os and then you'll install applications on that os and so on okay so here also you can have multiple vms and they are going to behave no different from the type 1 hypervisor is this clear any questions on this yes how are the operating systems different and how do they use the underlying hardware okay how do the how do these operating guest operating systems use the underlying hardware so first of all the guest of the the virtual machine is is exposing emulated or virtualized hardware to the operating system okay so it's an abstraction it's not real hardware and then it though that hardware is actually mapped onto the physical hardware okay so this guest os will see a disk okay that disk is just a some amount of storage on the physical disk is not the real physical disk that is exposed it will see some processors or cores those are virtual cores so virtual cores may get mapped onto physical cores that's done by the hypervisor so you don't actually see physical resources you see virtual hardware resources and then you just execute on virtual hardware resources and the hypervisor takes care of making sure the hard, virtual hardware resources are mapped onto physical hardware resources okay so that's how it would work the question here yes go ahead okay question is when you install windows and uh, linux side by side you install a software called grub is that a hypervisor okay grub is just a bootloader okay it's not a hypervisor a bootloader is simply a program that says 
I have multiple operating systems on my disk, which want to boot. Okay? Dual boot machines are not virtualization. Dual boot, you can make a machine dual boot. You can install more than one operating system on your physical disk, and you can choose either one or the other to boot. Okay. That just means that it just boots a different OS and that's OS is running on physical hardware. Okay. In virtualization, that's not the case. You can actually have two operating systems running at the same time. This you can never do in a real dual boot machine. You can only run one. Okay. So you can run 10 of them at the same time. There could be 10 different operating systems or 10 copies of Linux. Okay. So you can actually run multiple, but that has nothing to do with Grub, which is just a bootloader. Okay. So there's a different. There was you had a question, yes. Can a single type one hypervisor simulate multiple hardware architectures? Typically, no. Each hypervisor is designed to virtualize one type of hyper uh, hardware architecture. If you want to simulate something else, you would have to pick some other type of hypervisor. Okay. Unless you use emulation, an emulator can emulate different kinds of underlying because a single emulator may support multiple architectures in which case you can create vms that are of different types on the same one but that is that is much slower as i said this is actually native virtualization okay any other questions here okay so i will show you some examples assuming this works okay all right that did work so first thing is i want to show you Rosetta. So these are processes. I don't know if you can even see them in the back, but these are, this is just activity monitor. It shows all the processes that are running on this machine. That's a Mac. Okay. That's the name of the process. You can see all the threads, or you can pretty much see that every application has multiple threads uh, that you run. And this is the hardware architecture. So it's a kind say, it says Apple, that's actually an uh, M1 processor, which is an ARM processor. Okay. But if you scroll down, Scroll way down. Yeah, so you can see that this one actually, this one drive is an Intel processor, Intel binary. Okay, so in fact, there are many. I don't uh, I can start it, but I guess there are some at the bottom. So you'll see here is another one, and so on. Here's yet another one. So what this is doing is you can take a Mac application that was compiled for a Intel based Mac and it's running unmodified. Okay, it's almost running without any slowdown because they've done a good job of doing translation. So every instruction that does application is executing is an x86 instruction. This is an ARM processor, but it's getting translated and is executing as if it's running on a ARM machine, uh, sorry, an Intel machine. This is application level virtualization because I don't have any other virtualization software that's executing is just executing natively because there is this technique uh, that is used in uh, Max called Rosetta, which is to doing this translation on the flight translation. So you can run Intel binaries on ARM processor in this case. Okay. It's an example of application level virtualization. Okay. Here is uh, another example. Let me see if it works. Okay. So this is a type two hypervisor. If you use virtual box or anything like that, that's exactly the same here. This is a Ubuntu machine that is running on my uh, Mac OS. Okay. So the host operating system is Mac OS. Okay. I use a type two hypervisor called parallels. It's a commercial version like virtual box that allowed me to create this virtual machine. So this is the virtual machine and then I booted uh, Ubuntu in there. Okay, so now I'm running Linux on top of Mac OS. Okay, in this case we are using native virtualization because if you look, it says Ubuntu ARM. Okay, so I'm not running the x86 version of Ubuntu. I'm using an ARM-based version of Ubuntu. So there is no translation needed. Okay, the instruction set is the same. Okay, the virtual machine is exposing an ARM processor. To the to, to Linux and it is basically an underlying processor is also ARM. Okay, 
So this is an example of, and you can have more than one. I could have created a second virtual machines and I would have two operating systems, two guest operating systems running on one host. Okay. So, so that's that. And then I want to show one more thing here. Let me pause this. Okay, so interesting things is you can pause and in, you can't do that in a normal uh, uh, physical machine, but you can do things like I pause the OS. So OS is just paused, it's not running right now. If I unpause it, it starts executing again. Okay, you can suspend it, you can pause it, you can move it. So there are all kinds of things you can do with virtual machines as we will see. Okay, but let's look at one more thing, which is I have another um, virtual machine here. And this one is called QMO. This is full emulation. Okay. So this is essentially emulating an x86 processor. Okay. So this is what you are asking. This is Grub. So this is running an x86 pro emulated processor on top of my ARM processor. Okay. This is doing full emulation. It's emulating a full x86 PC in this case, which Parallels was not doing, it was native virtualization. It was doing same processor on same thing. So, so you will see that this is going to be very slow. Okay, so it's going to take a while to boot because it is taking every Intel instruction and doing a translation and running it because it's full emulation. Okay, so we are booting the OS, it's going to boot and then you'll see that uh, I'll show you that it's actually x86. Okay. So this So if I do U name minus say, you will see it will say, you can't see this probably in the back. Okay, so here, if you look, it's faint, but you can see it says x86. Okay. So this is essentially taking a stock x86 Linux and now running it in a fully emulated virtual machine. Okay. So these are just different technologies. So I showed emulation, I showed type two hypervisors and native virtualization, and I showed application level, uh, virtualization using Rosetta. Okay, three different techniques, do different use cases. Any questions on this? Okay, so so those are just examples. I didn't show type one because I would have to essentially boot a type one hypervisor and then show something. So obviously I can't do that on my Mac. Okay, but now let's get into the details of how these things work. Okay. What does the virtualization technology do for us? How does work type one work? How does type two work? How does para virtualization work? And then if you have time, we'll get into how OS virtualization works. Okay. So to understand type one hypervisors, you know, need to know a little bit about computer architecture. Okay. Undergrad level knowledge, but here is at least what you need to know. Okay. When any processor okay, that you buy, essentially when you run it, it supports at least two modes of operation, okay? At least two, but sometimes more than two. The two more basic modes are what is called user mode and kernel mode, okay? So essentially in the processor, uh, on the hardware, there is a bit, okay? If the bit is set, then it is in kernel mode. If the bit is not set, it's in user mode, okay? So you say, what's the difference? Can anybody know what's the difference? Yes. So in kernel mode, you can Yes, that's right. So, so let me explain what what uh, Walid just said. So, take all the assembly instructions that the processor supports. Okay? There will be several of them. Okay, you will label each instruction as either privileged or non-privileged, okay? By privileged, we mean uh, instructions that we only trust an operating system to execute, okay? And all other instructions, we allow user level applications to execute, okay? What does this mean? There are some instructions, we do not trust applications to execute themselves, okay? What are these instructions? Simple one is halt, okay? Halt is just going to shut the machine, okay? We don't want an arbitrary application to just issue a halt, and then your machine just shuts down. Typically you want the OS to deal with this kind of operation. Okay? And then there are many others like IO, okay? some type of memory management, 
You don't want one process to go and start accessing some other processes memory because the OS is protecting, OS and the hardware protects that for, for you. Okay. So some things we only allow OSs to do, other things we allow your user applications to do. So there is this bit which allows you to support user mode and kernel mode. Okay. So this much you need to know in order to understand how virtualization is going to work. So we'll call the set of instructions that execute in kernel mode as sensitive instructions or privileged instruction. Let's just call them uh, sensitive instruction for, for now. Okay. So that's one. Okay. Then we will define another term called privileged instructions. These are instructions that are going to cause a trap. Okay. Example of a privileged instruction is something that causes an interrupt. A trap is essentially an interrupt. So, so take all the assembly instructions, any of them that are going to cause an interrupt or a trap, we'll call them privileged. Okay? And then there is this famous result that says that you can implement a type one hypervisor on a processor only if this following condition is true. Okay? And the condition says that type one hyper virtualization is feasible if the sensitive instructions are a subset of privileged instruction. So that means that all sensitive instructions are also the ones that cause a trap. Okay. We'll see why this is the case, but first try to understand what it means. Okay. So first thing is there are instructions that only the OS can execute in kernel mode. Okay. It should be clear that when the CPU is in kernel mode, the OS kernel is executing on the CPU. You don't want to flip the bit to kernel mode and let an application execute, then it can do whatever the OS does. Okay. So in kernel mode, the OS executes, and when an application user process executes, the bit is set to user mode. Okay? User mode is always more restricted. It only allows you to execute a subset of the total instruction set. In kernel mode, you can execute all of them, including the ones that we'll call sensitive, which we don't trust the applications to execute by themselves. Okay? And then there are these other instructions that are instructions that cause a trap, IO instruction and so on. Yeah, and, and then what the result says is, on processors where the sensitive instructions are a subset of the privileged instruction. That means every sensitive instruction also causes a trap. That is when you can uh, implement uh, type one virtualization. Okay. Now, why is this the case? Okay, let's try to understand this a little bit. Okay, so in type one hypervisor, I'm going to go back one slide. Okay, you have booted the hypervisor. Okay. The hypervisor is the one that is going to run in kernel mode. Okay, because that is essentially the OS as far as the machine is concerned. That's what you boot on the OS. Okay. Now, suppose you run a virtual machine. In this case, you start that virtual machine and you run Windows in there. Okay. Now, that's a different OS, not the same as the hypervisor. Okay. Should you trust it as much as the hypervisor? Or should you trust it less? Okay, in this case, we are going to trust it less because there can be only one kernel. You don't want two kernels and they try to trample each other. Okay, only the, there's only one thing that we trust and that's what you boot. So this is the one that we'll essentially say is the kernel runs in kernel mode. Everything inside the virtual machine actually runs at a lower level of privilege. In fact, there are only two modes, then you're going to run the run it in user mode. Okay. Now, as far as Windows is concerned, it doesn't know it's running on a virtual machine. It thinks it's running on a physical machine. Okay. Because the virtual machine looks exactly like the physical machine. So Windows thinks it has full privileged access. It can do whatever it wants. Right? Because when the, when Windows believes it is the kernel. Okay. But in this case, it is actually not the real kernel. It's a guest operating system. This is the real kernel. Okay. So now Windows is designed to run sensitive instructions because it is the kernel inside the virtual machine. Okay. But now we put it in user mode because we said we don't trust Windows because this the hypervisor is what we trust. So now what should happen if Windows starts executing uh, sensitive instructions? Because in a normal physical hardware, that is exactly what Windows is supposed to do. It is supposed to run kernel instructions or the sensitive instruction. But in this case, because of virtualization, we are running Windows at a lower level of privilege. We are eff effectively running it in user mode. 
Windows doesn't know it, so it's still going to execute all of its instruct sensitive instructions as if it was running on real physical hardware. Okay, so now what should happen in this case? Because in user mode, you're not even allowed to do this, right? So let's, so how should you actually make this work? Okay, normally in some, uh, pro on some processors, if you're in user mode and you execute a, a sensitive instruction that's only can be executed in kernel mode, you will immediate, immediately terminate the process. You will just kill it, saying this is not allowed. And because you're trying to do something that you're not allowed to do. We can't do that here. So you can't just terminate Windows because it tried to execute a sensitive instruction. Right, so what should we do in this case? Yes, you have something. So if you want to execute these instructions, but you are not allowed to execute them, the only way to actually execute them is to tell the hypervisor to execute them for you because it can run those sensitive instructions. It is running in kernel mode. It's the only thing that can actually run those instructions. Okay? So whenever you are going to run a sensitive instructions, you will have to tell the hypervisor to execute it for you, right? So that's the way we are going to make it work. But how does the hypervisor know it has to execute something to begin with? Okay, this is why that trap property is true. So if the sensitive instruction causes a trap or an interrupt, what happens on an interrupt? Okay, whenever there's an interrupt, if you basically immediately switch to the kernel and the kernel actually executes an interrupt handler or a trap handler. Okay? So now if Windows executes the sensitive instruction and those instructions cause a trap, we will immediately go to the hypervisor. The hypervisor will see that Windows is trying to execute a sensitive instruction, and then it can execute that instruction in the trap handler and return back to Windows. Okay, is that clear what I just said? Okay, I'll show you a picture of exactly that happening, right? So here is the guest operating system. That's your type one hypervisor. The guest operating system thinks it is the actual OS but it's running inside a virtual machine. So it will execute kernel in instructions, like sensitive instruction in user mode. Okay? But in our case, we said that this will only work if those instructions cause a trap because you're not actually allowed to execute them. So you try to execute them. Since you're not allowed to execute them in the user mode, it causes a trap. You go to the hypervisor, that's the that's a trap on privilege instruction. You execute that instruction and you come back up. And Windows just thinks it executed that instruction. In fact, the hypervisor executed it for them. Okay, yes. Right. So question is, what does the hypervisor do if there are instructions that it, uh, uh, that it may not want so to execute? So uh, the example is, what if you want to turn off the virtual? So if Windows tries to turn off the virtual machine, I mean, uh, it gives a halt instruction, you will halt the virtual machine, not the physical in machine, right? You are not going to blindly execute whatever the uh, guest operating system does. You are going to interpret it and do what it actually wants you to do, right? So in this case, if Windows is, saying halt, it is asking you to halt the virtual machine. It's not asking because it doesn't even know about the physical machine. It's running inside a VM. So you will essentially implement that by stopping the virtual machine as an example, right? It's not like you just execute it exactly as is. You will execute it in a way that makes sense in the virtualization framework. Okay. Yes. Uh, it is a sensitive instruction. So if you want type one hypervisor to work, all sensitive instructions are also privileged because they cause a trap. There may be other instructions that cause a trap that are not in kernel mode, but every kernel mode instruction is also causing a trap. So it's a privileged instruction, okay? Right, the question is if there are instructions that are actually executable in user mode to the guest OS run. Yes, they they do run in guest mode. Example of such an instruction is sleep, where right? you can put a process to sleep for some period of time, a timer goes off, that causes a user level interrupt and that run. That doesn't need a hypervisor. You can just do that kind of stuff without 
uh, without trapping to the hypervisor. Right. So if it is a uh, if it's instruction that is being run in user mode uh, and it traps, then you are going to do something about it because if it's a trap, you will always go to the kernel. Okay. In this case, you may not actually have to do anything because it's a it's not a sensitive instruction. Okay. You see what instruction it is. If it's not sensitive, you can just do something that is much simpler than actually doing uh, implementing a sense uh, a kernel level instruction. Uh, in the next slide, are sensitive and privileged use. No, every privileged instruction is going to cause a trap. You will always come to the hypervisor. Okay? And if that privileged instruction happens to be a sensitive instruction, the hypervisor will execute it on behalf of Windows. If it's some other kind of instruction, you will just do whatever Windows would have done. Right? Doesn't require any privilege there. Okay. So now let me say one more thing. This property. Although it makes sense, this is how we are going to implement type one hypervisor. Many processors did not support. Okay? In particular, Intel processors until recently did not support that property. Okay? If you are in user mode and you try to essentially execute a sensitive instruction, you would just ignore them. You wouldn't cause a trap. You would say not allowed and just ignore. Okay? So it wouldn't cause a trap. It wouldn't do anything. It would just basically be like a no op instruction. It didn't do anything. Okay. So if you did that, then you cannot implement type one hypervisors on Intel machines. Okay. So early Intel processors did not allow you to implement type one hypervisor. They could only do type two hypervisors, which doesn't require anything like this. Okay. Type two hypervisors requires that you boot a normal OS, like I just showed you, and then that runs like a normal application, the hypervisor. Okay. That doesn't need all of these properties, only type one hypervisors need. Okay. So Intel didn't support it until recently. And then they added extra hardware support to implement virtualization. In Intel, this is called VT virtualization technology. And in AMD, it's called SVM, something virtual machine. I forgot what the S means. Okay. But both of them by uh, allow you to create a bit mask that says for these instructions, create a trap. So it allows you to actually turn on virtualization saying, I'm going to now turn on virtualization support on the processor. And then for every instruction in your instruction set, you can turn on a bit that says, if this instruction is executed in virtual mode, cause a trap. Okay, so essentially it allows you to then go back to this result and say, make sure that actually is true on this machine. But you can turn it off and then you'll get the old behavior. If you don't need to run a type and hypervisor, you don't need it, okay, but you can turn it on and then you get that property. So if you are running a type one hypervisor, then you want to make sure that bitmap is actually turned on for all of your sensitive instructions. And then it will work like you expect it to work. Is this clear? So that's the picture you want to keep in mind. Okay, so you have the hardware, what you're booting on the hardware is a type one hypervisor, which is just a special OS. It's only designed to run virtual machine, it doesn't run normal application. Then you can create as many VMs as you want. Each of them, you can boot a guest operating system in it and then run normal application. Okay. And then the guest OS thinks it's running on real hardware, but it's running on emulated hardware. And then it will run in lower level privilege. If you have only two modes, you run in the, the guest OS in user mode. Can okay. Intel, you actually have more than two modes. And that is that picture that is shown there. You, in Intel, these modes are called rings. Okay. Kernel mode is same as ring zero. That's the most trusted. Okay. And then you have lower level uh, levels of trust. So ring one gives you less privileges than ring zero. Ring two gives you even less privileges. And then there is ring three. Ring three is effectively user mode, least privilege. You only run normal OSs in there. Ring zero is the most trusted. Okay. That's what whatever you boot on the machine should run in ring zero. Okay. And in virtualization case, you will run things like Windows at ring one or ring two, but uh, actual applications inside the VM, you learn at even less privileges. This gives that OS that is running inside a VM a little more privilege than the applications that is running. Okay? But you don't need that effectively. You can just do everything with two modes. 
Okay, so long as the property we discussed is true. Is this clear? Okay, so now let me talk a little bit about some examples, then we'll talk about type two hypervisors. Okay, so there are many examples that you can think of uh, that do type one hypervisors. Uh, there's one called ESX server. This was designed by VMware. Okay, here's an example. That example picture is not very different from what I showed you previously. You run boot ESX server on top of hardware. And then you can see that there are three virtual machines running three different operating systems there. Okay, two running Linux and one running Windows. Okay, same picture as before. Okay, not very different. Okay, here is how you do this in the Windows world. In Windows, uh, the supports a type one hypervisor called Hyper-V. Okay, this is essentially present only in Windows Server. You just have a Windows uh, desktop OS, it's not going to have Hyper-V in it. Okay? And this is how it looks. Okay, there's a complicated picture, but you don't have to worry about it. it essentially, it takes the machine and creates what are called partitions. So you run, you first boot Hyper-V, okay, that's here. Okay? And then on top of Hyper-V, you are going to, in the parent partition, you are going to run real windows. Okay, you always have to actually run windows as one OS on Hyper-V. You can't just, in this case, you can run whatever OS you want. It doesn't limit you. You can just run only Linux. Okay? If you have Hyper-V, there is at least one copy of windows that's always running on it. Okay? That's run in the parent partition. Can run the, so, so child partitions can run, these are actual virtual machines and they can run whatever else you want to run on Linux and other operating system. Okay? So there's a little bit of a limitation in this. This is not a hypervisor that allows you to run any arbitrary VMs. It does, but you still have to run one copy of Windows in your parent partition. Okay, that's here. So all these things are just Windows. Okay? And here you can have another virtual machine and yet another virtual machine and so on. Okay. So that's how you have this in Hyper-V. And here is the picture for how Linux implements type one hypervisor. So in Linux, there is something called KVM. Okay, that stands for kernel virtual machine. Okay. It's implemented as a device driver to support type one hypervisors. Okay. KVM by itself only implements part of the support needed to run a type one hypervisor. It doesn't do all of it. It expects that there are some other components that will be used in order to implement a full type one hypervisor. Okay, so it only implements part of this. Okay? So as an example, in the Linux kernel, you have KVM that is giving you bare bones support for type one hypervisor. But then on top of that, you can run things like QEMU that I was showing you earlier and things like libword. The collection of these three things together give you all the functionality of a type one hypervisor. Okay? The reason it does it this way is that it doesn't limit you to using one type of type one hypervisor. KVM is, support to, uh, is designed to support other kinds of software that also provide type one hypervisor functionality. Okay? So it basically says here is the bare bone support for doing type one, but you can implement your own rest of the functionality in, uh, in Linux and then the two collectively will give you a full type one hypervisor functionality. Okay? QMO and KVM is one way. Okay, here's another example. In Chrome OS, okay, which is Google's OS that you get on Chromebooks, that's actually a version of Linux. Okay? And by default, it will only run the Google apps, like the Google, Google Mail and Google Drive and all of those things. But if you can actually run something called cross VM on it, okay, that essentially takes KVM and it's basically another uh, layer on top that gives you a type one hypervisor. And then you can run other Linux applications inside it. That's an example of an alternative approach where you use KVM and some other software that implements type one hypervisor function. Okay. So it's more flexible, but it doesn't do all the job. It needs other components to do a full type one hypervisor. Okay, your question. Okay, question is, can you have, uh, okay, can you have type two type one hypervisors on the same machine? Okay, so typically you cannot have two type one hypervisor because 
you can only boot one OS on the machine. You cannot boot two OSs on the machine. Okay. So in type one hypervisor, you boot that as the OS. So you can have multiple virtual machines, okay? but you cannot have multiple hypervisors that are type one hypervisors. Okay? You can have multiple type two hypervisors because type two hypervisor is simply an application. In fact, I showed you that I was running parallels and I was running this other QMO. There were two type two hypervisors that were running on my machine here when I showed you the example. So that's different because those are running at an application level. Okay. Any questions here? Okay. So let's talk now about type two hypervisor. Okay. So type two hypervisor is essentially an application that you run on your guest or host operating system rather. Okay. And in that application, you can create virtual machines and you can then boot whatever OS you want on top of it. Okay. So this is going to be a little different because in this case, the type two hypervisor does not have kernel level privileges because it's running like a user standard application. Okay. And then there is an OS running inside that application. Okay. So here is the picture that I showed you. Okay. So the host operating system, which is Mac OS, Windows, Linux is what you boot. That is the only thing that's actually going to be privileged. That's the thing that runs in kernel. This thing here is now just an application. In type one hypervisor, it had full privileges. Here it just runs as an application. And inside there is a guest OS running. You can run Windows in there. And Windows thinks that it can run privileged operation. Okay. But it's just running on a type two hypervisor, which is itself a standard application. It Type two hypervisor itself doesn't have the privileges to do what Windows might want to do. Because even in this case, Windows is going to execute uh, a sensitive instruction. Because the question is, how do we make all this work? So the way you do this in type two hypervisor is to do what is called dynamic code translation. So what the type two hypervisor does is it's going to load the instructions that the kernel is about to execute and it's going to scan them okay? on the fly at runtime. As you're executing instructions, you scan the code and you look for sensitive instructions. Okay? Clearly those instructions cannot be executed in user mode. You already said that. Okay? Now, how do you deal with this? What you will do is you will replace those sensitive instructions on the fly with small function calls. Okay? Those functions, so that's binary translation. Okay, you are essentially going to replace them by with procedure calls. And those procedure calls are then going to essentially make system calls to the actual OS. Is that clear what I said? So you are going to, in this case, when the type two hypervisor is executing the guest OS, is going to scan the code. And if that code is about to execute a sensitive instruction, you replace that sensitive instruction in the binary with another instruction that makes a function call, okay? an equivalent instruction. And in that function, you are going to essentially have the code to make a system call to the OS, because at the end of the day, you still have to call the OS to execute that for you. Right? And you're going to call the OS to deal with that for you. So in the previous case, executing that instruction automatically caused a trap and you went to the hypervisor. In this case, you don't have that luxury anymore. So you are going to take the instructions as they're executing on the fly and change them to essentially be function calls. Those function calls will be implemented in the type two hypervisors and they will make system calls on your BR. So you're still going to ask the OS in this case, the host operating system to implement sensitive operations, but you're going to do it through dynamic code translation or binary translation. Okay, so that's essentially what is shown there. So this is going to introduce some slowdown because you are actually scanning code. Anything that's not sensitive can be executed natively. Anything that's sensitive, you are actually going to invoke a function because there's no trap happening here. You're going to invoke a function and then execute it. Is that clear? Okay. So because you do this, you don't need any VT support. You can actually run this on machines where there is no requirement for saying that the sensitive instructions are also privileged and they cause trap because you don't need them to cause a trap. You just eliminated them. You never execute them to begin with. You modify them and, uh, and execute a different instruction instead that invokes a function. Okay. 
Okay. So as a result, you could run type two hypervisors on older hardware, even though type one hypervisors would not run on that hardware. They did not have the property we needed, but we don't need that property for type two because we came up with a different approach to deal with our sensitive instructions. Is that clear? What I said? Okay. So examples of this are virtual box. If you used it, VMware, Workstation, Fusion, Parallels Desktop that I was just showing you, that's also doing the same thing. Right? So it's basically scanning the code on the fly and only the OS code needs to be scanned because the applications we don't care. Yeah, if the application executes something is not supposed to execute, it's just terminate. Okay. Okay. So now you can say, this is going to be slow because you are actually looking through kernel code every time it's executing and every time you change these instructions. Okay. Can we do this, implement the same idea some other way? And if you think about it, another way to do this is actually go and rather than doing this at runtime, you have some programmer go and look at your kernel code. Okay. And you look in the kernel code for every sensitive operation you have written code for, and you just replace them with that function call and you recompile your kernel. Okay, that is going to give you para virtualization. This is why you need a modified OS to implement para virtualization, because in para virtualization, you designed a kernel that is effectively going to run in user mode. Okay, this kernel is designed to run in user mode. So, what you have done is you actually went and eliminated all the sensitive instruction by replacing them in your source code okay, with these high, and here we are going to call them hyper calls. Okay. You essentially replace them instead of having that trap, you actually say instead of the sensitive instruction, I'm going to make a call to the hypervisor and let it execute it for me. Right. So we are going to essentially go and remove all the sensitive instructions from our OS kernel and replace them with hyper calls. So instead of a trap, we're explicitly making a call to the hypervisor saying, go and do this for me. Okay. And then you got a modified OS okay, where you no longer have any sensitive instructions, you replace them. And every time you have to do a sensitive operation, you are going to now invoke your hyper call, which is a function call. This was exactly the same function call in type to hypervisor that you inserted into the binary on the fly. Okay. Here you are inserting it into source code. So you do it once you recompile, then there is no need to scan the code at runtime or anything like that. Is this clear? What you're saying? Okay. So this requires that you modify the OS kernel to actually run as a type on type one hypervisors, even without requiring any hardware support. The reason you want to do this is if you have a processor that does not support a type one hypervisor. Okay you can still run a para virtualized OS kernel on it because it is going to take all your sensitive instructions and explicitly call the hypervisor because there is no longer a technique where you can trap to the hypervisor because the hardware doesn't support traps okay, on older hardware. You don't need to do this on newer hardware where you actually have that function and you don't need to modify the OS at all. Okay? But if you want to run on older hardware, you've got to go change the OS. And that's how you're going to make it work. Yes, question. Okay, so no, I mean, that picture is somewhat old. It is just saying that the type one hypervisor is a small kernel. It's like a micro kernel, but we don't need to worry about that. It is a type one hypervisor. It is a type one hypervisor, yes. Okay. This is the one that you essentially modified. No, so, okay, so let, so that is basically running a modified Linux, right? So, so that is actually trapping to the hypervisor. So what you're running inside operating systems, uh, sorry, not operating, inside virtual machines are para virtualized operating systems. You cannot run unmodified operating systems inside VMs. I don't know if that makes sense. Right, so the hypervisor is not changed. It's the OS that has changed. So this is still the same whole hypervisor. It is just that you cannot run unmodified operating systems 
because there is no nuge, the unmodified OS will trap to the hypervisor because this underlying processor does not support it. So you run modified operating systems where you replace all the sensitive instructions with hyper calls. Okay, so the, that is called para virtualization. Okay, so you will see the modified Linux and modif. Uh, so this is essentially para virtualization. So this picture is actually showing true virtualization and para virtualization. So you should cut this in half. It's not that there are two hypervisors running. It's a picture from the book. So if that is what you are asking, then maybe I should explain this. So think of these are two independent pictures. That is a type one hypervisor that runs unmodified OS and the hardware supports it. This is essentially also a type one hypervisor, but it runs a modified OS. Okay? It's not that both are running at the same time. You essentially have to think of this picture as two pictures effectively. Okay, yes, question. Yes, so you can just run a micro kernel. I mean, it is effectively a hypervisor, but it is like a small OS because you don't need to do a lot of things because the OS has already been modified to take care of a lot of what you do as a virtualization. There. So there is no special case. Uh, right, so th there is no special chain needed. You can uh, optimize it, but you can run it on small kernels as well. Okay, any other questions here? Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of a para virtualization hypervisor, which is called the Zen hypervisor. This was essentially one of the early hypervisors that Linux supported before KVM became popular. Okay, now KVM is the default type one hypervisor in Linux. Okay, but in the early days when the hardware did not support type one hypervisors, the way you could do this was you essentially ran a para virtualized version of uh, Linux, and that was essentially implemented as the Zen hypervisor. Okay, and that's the picture shown here. So you have essentially your hardware. Okay, this is Zen that you're booted here. Okay, and then you essentially have a guest operating system Linux that's running here that is running all the control elements of the virtualization layer. Okay, so this is called domain zero. This is, think of this as similar to Windows, where you have the hypervisor, but you still need one OS to do some of the extra work. In the Hyper-V case, I said you have Hyper-V, but I still need Windows to run before I run other virtual machine. It's the same here. Okay, You have Zen, but you need one Linux to run in what is called domain zero. This is like the master partition, where you essentially do all of the hard work, and these are essentially your uh, virtual machines. Okay. except that they're all modified versions of uh, operating system kernels because this is all para virtualization. Okay. Is that clear? Okay, so there is a nice paper on this uh, Zen architecture. I will make that available if you want to go look at it. Yeah, but let's talk a little bit about um, other resources. Uh, most of what we talked about was how to virtualize uh, CPU. Okay. But clearly when you virtualize a machine, you have to virtualize all the resources. There is disk, there's network interface, there's memory, and there's the processor at a minimum. And there may be other hardware resources. So effectively you have to present virtualized version of all resources to a virtual machine, not just the CPU, right? So we won't go into as much detail into all these other resources, but I'll say a few words about each of them. Okay. Now in case of memory, what happens is uh, the virtual machine is going to be allocated memory by the hypervisor. Okay? Typically the OS allocates memory to processes. OS has full control over RAM and it decides what RAM pages get allocated to what processes and so on. Okay? In this case, the hypervisor controls RAM because the hypervisor actually is the trusted entity that you're booted. Okay? So the hypervisor has to allocate memory to the guest OS, the guest OS has to allocate memory to its processes. Okay? So there's two levels of allocation that is going on here. Okay? So without going into too many details, the way the hypervisor actually makes it work is to essentially keep something called a shadow page table. Okay? There is the original page table that maintains the mapping of the 
pages allocated to a process. Okay? Now the OS cannot actually change those memory mappings because that's a sensitive operation. Okay? Changing memory mapping, doing IO, running halt, all of these are sensitive operations. So the guest operating system can't actually change hardware level page tables. Okay? So what you do is you keep another copy of the page tables with the hypervisor, which you call a shadow page table. Okay? When you touch the original page table, you cause a trap, you go to the shadow page table, you make the modification in the shadow page table, and they get reflected in the original page table because you are essentially, they are copies of each other. Okay? So that is how, so you are going to play the same kind of trick where you trap to the hypervisor and do make the hypervisor do the work. But since you are not executing instructions, you are making changes to memory mapping, you essentially have to do something similar. But what you will do is you will keep a copy in the hypervisor where you make the changes. And then you have this two level mapping okay, from the original page table to the shadow page table. Okay. So that's a very high level, very short description of how you can virtualize memory. There are lots of details, but we won't go into them in this class. Okay. If you're interested, there are papers that will tell you more. I talked about how to do the processors, but we will ignore the details of more details of how do you do memory and so on. Okay, but I'll say a little bit about the disk because this is something that you will actually encounter when you play with virtual machine. Okay, so how does the hypervisor virtualize the disk? Okay, so you have a physical disk on your machine. Okay? Typically, your OS is going to manage that. If you run Windows, Windows will manage your disk. You have a C drive and so on. You run Linux, Mac, it is managing the disk. Okay. Now, regardless of whether you're doing type one or type two hypervisor, the guest OS cannot directly read or write to disks or cannot read or write to disk blocks because that's a privileged operation. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to present an emulated version of the disk to the OS. Okay. This emulated version of a disk is actually implemented as one large file on your file system. Okay, so this file is essentially a virtual disk. So when you are, when the OS is reading or writing to its disk, you are effectively underneath reading or writing to this file. The file behaves like a disk. Okay, it, it's basically presented as a disk. All the contents of the virtual disk are stored in this one giant file. The file could be gigabytes in size because typical disks are large. And so if you have things like a virtual machine image, you will see that it has something called a virtual disk file in there. Okay, that's basically the, the disk that is presented to the OS. In, in VMware, it's called VMDK file. Virtual uh, box is called, I think, VDisk or something uh, like a virtual disk file. So they are essentially files on your file system that are used by the OS and emulate, and you essentially use them to emulate a disk. So the files provide storage for the emulated disk. Okay. So that's how you're going to virtualize your disk. And then you essentially have the network uh, or the ethernet cards or your Wi-Fi card. They are also emulated similarly. You present an emulated hardware. And when the OS or the application tries to read or write network data, when you try to send packets, you're going to use the underlying physical hardware to actually read or write to send packets or receive packets, whether you're doing RPCs or network sockets, you are essentially going to communicate. So you will present virtualized versions of these hardware, but then use the physical hardware to actually read or write or send or receive data. Okay. So in some sense, you're emulating many of these devices, okay. but you use some physical resources to implement that emulation. So one last thing I'll mention, and then we may will talk a little bit about OS virtualization just to introduce the topic. Okay. So one of the uh, nice things about virtual machines is that it gives you a easy way to distribute applications and software. You can essentially have what are called uh, virtual appliances. An appliance is essentially a virtual machine, a pre-built virtual machine on which the OS has been pre-installed the application has been pre-installed and pre-configured. So you just download that virtual machine appliance, which is a virtual disk file and execute it. And then the OS boots up and the application that's already installed and pre-built just boots up. And then 
you can just run that application. Okay? This makes it much easier for someone to then use that application rather than downloading the application, installing it, configuring it. So that's all extra work for the user. You can avoid that by distributing pre-built application okay? as virtual appliances. Okay? Docker images are the same thing, but using OS level virtualization. Okay? Virtual appliances are the same concept, but now you distribute an entire VM. So it will have to include an OS in it. it can't just be the application because the VM boots an OS first. Okay? In Docker, you don't include the OS, you only include the application because the OS is outside, not inside the VM, it's outside the VM. Okay? But same concept, okay? you can use virtual appliances for software distribution, you just download and run, no need to install, no need to configure and so on. Okay. And then there is also uh, additional details of if you have multiple cores and your multiple virtual machines, you can do careful allocations of resources. You can say this VM gets two of my cores. This other VM gets only one core. Okay. This VM gets six GB of RAM. This VM gets two GB of RAM. You can control all of the allocation of how much your VM gets how much that virtual appliance gets and so on by configuring the, uh, the virtual machine itself. And we'll sh show you some examples of that in our homework later. So as I said, today virtual appliances are evolving into Docker containers simply because it's far more efficient to distribute just the application without a big OS inside the VM. Otherwise you have to download a much bigger appliance or a much smaller Docker container, but same concept distribute pre-built, pre-configured applications. Okay, so, so we'll come back to use of virtualization in a couple of classes, but I just want to mention that they are widely used. Okay, virtualization technology is used in data centers and cloud computing. Okay, when you go to a cloud platform and request a machine, okay, they're not giving a physical machine, they're giving a virtual machine. Okay, that virtual machine is mapped onto some physical machine. So most of these cloud computing platforms are going to use virtualization underneath okay, to allow you to run software on other machines. Okay? So it's widely used both in data centers and cloud computing, which are data centers where you can lease your resources to other customers. And then you can also use them in desktop world. You okay, already said you can use it for software development, testing, run applications from another platform and so on. Okay. And when you run inside a virtual machine, you still get full access to the virtual machine. You can be root, you can be administrator and so on, except that you're controlling the VM, not the underlying physical machine. Okay, so there's still a difference between what you can do. Any last questions here before I take maybe a minute to introduce the next topic and then we'll end. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about OS virtualization and then I'm going to stop. Okay, so most of this we'll of course cover tomorrow, next class, but uh, I'll start talking about what is OS virtualization. So what I talked today was virtualizing the hardware. We emulated a machine and then ran an OS on top of that machine inside a virtual machine. Okay, OS virtualization is Virtualization as the next layer up, rather than emulating the hardware interface, you emulate the OS interface. Okay. So what can you use it for? So remember that virtualization was used native interface to emulate another one, that's our definition. Okay. In this case, the interface is the OS interface. So we are essentially taking the OS interface, which is the system call interface, to emulate another OS interface. So what can you do with this? Okay. One example is okay, you can essentially use that OS interface to emulate an older version of the OS. Okay. Remember how virtualization arose that I said this maybe last time. So you basically, it was designed in the 60s and 70s where when the OS changed, you use a virtualization layer and you told users saying you can just run your old applications on that virtualization layer. It will look like it's running on the old OS. Right, that problem hasn't gone away now because you, if you do an OS upgrade and then your applications break, then you got to do something, got to fix them. Okay, one option is you upgrade the OS, 
but then use OS level virtualization to for older applications so that they, they get present at the old OS interface, not the new OS interface. So then they don't break anymore because if they run on the new OS natively, the OS interface has changed. Maybe you have to go recompile them and uh, fix the problems. Okay? So this is often used in containers to emulate older versions of the kernel to run legacy applications. So they don't actually stop running because the OS has changed or anything like that. So, so you can present older versions for backward compatibility with the OS. That's one example. Okay. The other example is essentially what you do with Linux containers and Docker and so on. Okay. In this case, you're using OS virtualization in a way where the kernel takes a set of processes and isolates them. It puts them in a sandbox and it isolates them from other processes. Okay. That's called a container. The container is essentially going to contain some applications or processes. Okay. These processes cannot see what's outside the container. There may be 10 other processes running outside the container. What is in cannot see what's out because they are limited to just seeing each other. They're limited to what resources, what files they can see on the machine, what other processes they can see and so on. Okay. So you basically create this sandboxing mechanism where you isolate these processes from the rest of the machine. Okay. And so in this case, you are giving an abstraction of an OS which is more limited than the actual OS. So you're just hiding some of the resources from what is inside the container. So essentially you're emulating a more restricted version of the OS using the native interface. That's how you're using OS level virtualization. Okay? Now each of those instances is still going to look like a full OS, except that you don't see all the resources on the machine. You don't see the other processes. You might be limited from seeing what files you can see and so on. Okay? So that is what we mean by OS virtualization. And I'm going to stop here with this picture. So this is the picture you want. So essentially you have your kernel, your container, and then these applications are sandbox inside containers. Okay. These are lightweight VMs. Okay. But remember now they don't run their own OS. There's only one OS running, which is the host OS. So you're not running another OS inside your VM. You just run a process that doesn't see other processes. Okay. So that is what OS level virtualization is. And then we'll continue this tomorrow and talk about how it works and so on. Okay. Uh,